Broadcasting live from Baltimore, Maryland, the Breath of Life Ministries presents Experience the Power. When God gets ready, He can deliver you. If you call on Him, if you trust in Him, He's worthy of the praise. Ooh, 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 ooh. Oh, You're supposed to be down flat on your face, but the power of God will lift you up. And now let's go live to the Miracle Temple Worship Center, where our service is in progress. Well, tonight uh, I'm going to do a subject that most people are afraid of. And uh, I don't like to be typical. I really don't. So uh, you've noticed, I hope, that not a lot of things we preach about are frightening. Because Jesus is the center of what we preach. And so long as Jesus is in the middle of it, it's very difficult to make it sound frightening. What do you think? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I'll give you the the text with the title in it. There are people who like to see that right away, so we'll give you that, and uh, some folk can be happy and maybe take a little nap, <laughs> but you better do it in the corner because they'll turn up the volume on you and get you back awake again. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at verse 22 and verse 23. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive but every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. That has it in it, you'll see it, but before we move, you know what we do. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the truth that is in the word of God. And we have enjoyed it from night to night. We have seen some things that were challenges to us, we have seen other things that gave us great joy, but everything that's in the Word of God is a blessing. So don't fail us tonight. Give us the presence of the Holy Spirit. Let His presence be felt everywhere in every downlink site. And I pray, Father, that because of that power, we shall be blessed in the name of Jesus. Amen. So the Bible says that... Uh, there will come a day when there will be a resurrection of the dead. I want to begin with the reason why resurrection and death, if you please, has to be seen in a particular way. I want to suggest to you that Satan gets bold from time to time and challenges God in a very foolish fashion. Nobody should challenge God. And Satan ought to know better. Remember, he was Lucifer, the light bearer. He went up against God in heaven and apparently did not win. He came falling down like lightning from heaven. So anybody who ought to know, it ought to be Satan. But he gets bold from time to time. If you go with me to uh, Genesis, the third chapter, let's begin in the beginning. And this is pivotal to understand why this subject is so important. Genesis chapter 3, and let's find out what Satan said when he got too bold for his own good. This is verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Now take that by itself, and it sounds innocuous. But if you understand that in Romans chapter 6, you remember that text we've done over and over again? The wages of sin is what? But the gift of God is eternal life. So if God says the wages of sin is death, what that serpent said, and let's be real about it, no snake was talking here. This was Satan himself having impersonated or borrowed. Some would even say that Satan became the first ventriloquist. Whatever it was, here was the figure of a serpent, but the devil talking. And he says to Eve, curling himself in the very tree that God said, don't touch. You know, it, it, it worries me a little bit. I know that I am no more wise than Eve or Adam, but if God said you can have all the trees, except one don't go near that one don't touch it 
you would think that you could find everything your heart desired in another tree. But temptation is that way. Sometimes what is prohibited is attractive. Are you honest enough to agree with that? Sometimes it's the very thing that you can't have that you want. I could talk very briefly about spouses. Just real brief, briefly about it. Who may have somebody at home who is attractive. But just the prohibition against someone outside draws them. You had better try your best by the power of God to resist that because that can get you into deep trouble. And this audience is a little quiet for me tonight. You're making me nervous. But the fact is that, that this, this declaration, in fact, the serpent with fruit is saying, God told you if you ate of the fruit, you die. I'm telling you that you will not really die. What does that mean? What is not really die? Is there something between life and death? Well, I've met people who somehow seem that they were not all the way alive, but the fact is that there is nothing between life and death. You are either alive or you're dead. Satan says you can disobey God, and I'm proving it to you. I'm in the tree. The fruit won't kill you. And so he puts his will equal to God's will. He presumes to say what God has said is not true. He puts himself again. And you know that was his, that was his problem from the beginning. He said, I'll be like the Most High. So let me, let me give you the key to understanding this whole thing. Otherwise, it will seem trivial to you. But the fact is that the beginning of this thesis that Satan put out and, and the reaction of what God's word says means that the devil tells lies even if they are against God himself. And if you see that, then you'll understand where we're going. So the, the, the issue is this. If God says you'll die and Satan says you won't really die, who's right? Well, let's hope everyone understands that. The fact is that in the Bible, there is a discussion of what death really is. Go with me, if you would, to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6. You must, you must understand that this is, this is not ordinary death that we're talking about. The Bible will make it clear that uh, there are at least two kinds of death. Now somebody's really worried. They were worried about dying, and now I'm saying there are two kinds. Well, let's see what the Bible says. It's important. Verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. A powerful text. It says that if you are in Christ, you will come in the first resurrection. Those who die in Christ are not left. They are brought up first because they must know, they must recognize that when you give yourself to Jesus Christ, he never goes back on his word. So if you die in Christ, you are resurrected first. In fact, being dead, believing before you die in Christ is a guarantee that you'll come forth again not only come forth, but come forth first. I would take coming forth at any time. I'd take resurrection at any time, but I like first. But then it says you will not have part in the second death. And I want to explain it as best I can, that the death we see every day is not the one that you need to be worried about finally, because you'll rise again and you'll rise first. If you live in Christ and die in Christ, you've got his promise that you'll come forth again. The second death is different than the first. The first death, if I could call it that, is simply the result of sin. There are people who live wonderful lives, eat wonderful diets, practice all kinds of Christian living, but they still die. 
I know a lady who, who ate so carefully. In fact, I remember going to her house and I went there as a teenager and she brought out cereal for breakfast and she said, we don't use milk. I said, well, what do you use? She said, milk has things in it that will clog your arteries. I said, yeah, but what do you use? She said, we, we put water on our cereal. Don't try this at home. I've, I've, I've gotten kind of smart now. I'm, I've learned to use a product. I almost said its name, but I, but I can't do free advertisements. It's a soy product that tastes better than milk. <laughs> but it doesn't have the downside. So I put that on my cereal. Whoa, what is great. I mean, bad cereal tastes good with this product. So, so I've sneaked around it. But this lady was so careful. And, and I was shocked when she died of cancer. What you must understand is that living in this environment, even if you live a godly life, you should not think that people have done anything wrong because they get diseases and die. God can intervene miraculously, but he does not choose always to intervene. And the reason why he doesn't have to is because God has the antidote. Jesus, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. The fact is that if you die in Christ, it's already settled. But the second death, now remember I said the first is the result of sin. The second death is the punishment for sin. And nobody, you know, there are folk who think, well, I lived a long time, so I must have been holy. Eh, I know some people who are not even close to holy, who refuse to die. <laughs> I have a friend who's a great theologian who says that the reason why God allows evil people to live longer is because they aren't right yet. And they need time. I'm not sure I buy into that. But the fact is that the death we see every day is not the punishment for sin. I've had people say to me, because people live certain kinds of lives, they cut their lives off. I believe that. But I do not believe that the death we see all the time is the punishment for sin. It is simply the result of living in a sinful atmosphere. Let me tell you, you die the second death, that is not going to be the same thing. That is final death. That is incontrovertible evidence that you have lived a life against God. And there will come a day, in fact, I've got a sermon, I'll preach on it real soon. There will come a day when God has had enough of rebellious people. And those people who refuse the mercy of Jesus, those people who will not live as the Bible suggests, as the Bible commands, those people who say nobody can tell me what to do. Their punish will, punishment will not be dying like we see all the time. It will be eternal death. And that's the one you're worried about. So first let me suggest that God has the antidote to the death that we see all the time. And that the second death is the punishment for sin. It's the one that people will get who would not accept the mercy of Christ. Now, I must say to you that Jesus has already expressed where he is in this process. I know people who believe that God is watching all the time. I, I've, I've mentioned that when I was a boy, I would go to these little religious services and they sang a song there that will not leave me, not even now. He sees all you do. He hears all you say. My Lord is watching all the time and I remember as a boy I'd go I'd go home and I'd in fact I hadn't even reached the age where I could do much sin I couldn't figure it out but I knew that that somewhere God was watching all the time whoever wrote that song probably meant well but it gave me many a sleepless night the fact is that God is not the one who's against you. He is watching. Well, go to 2 Peter. Let's, let's find the text. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. 
second Peter chapter 3 verse 9 let's get let God tell you where he is in the whole picture second Peter chapter 3 verse 9 the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness but is long-suffering to usward not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance so let's get one thing straight and that's this if you die the second death Jesus did not help you do it if you resist him you have resisted him with full knowledge that he was on your side he's watching he's watching to help he's watching to love he's watching to intervene he's watching so that when you get on the brink of some awful move he can try his best to love you back from the brink until you don't do that I know it because I've experienced it is there anybody else who might have felt that <laughs> I, I have heard him I, I've heard him so clearly it almost sounded like somebody's voice and what he was trying to say is don't do that so I know he's there but I know where he is in the, in, in the equation. Let me suggest to you, in fact, some people think that because of the way that I'm about to preach death, that it is in fact some strange punishment and that God may find joy in death. Let me prove that he does not. Uh, go with me, if you will, to uh, Psalm 116. I can't read all of these, but some of them must be read. Psalm 116. You must understand first that God finds no pleasure in the death of those who love him. In fact, God finds no pleasure in anybody because he told you, I'm not willing that any should perish. That includes people who are good and people who are not. God doesn't want anybody to die, so he, he doesn't want you either to stay in your sin. He wants us to come to repentance, to change the way we think. Psalm 116, and somebody already has it, and then let me find it. And look at verse 15, and here's what the Bible says. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Precious. That means that God does not allow somebody to die without noticing it. If Jesus sees a sparrow fall, don't you know that your mother, your father, your relative who loved Jesus, don't you know that that death is noted and that the life of that person was precious in the sight of Jesus? So when somebody dies, there is no joy in heaven. God is not pleased even when people who don't obey die. He wants everybody to come to repentance and live. And the death of someone who has died in Christ particularly is precious in his sight. Uh, if you would turn with me to Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13. Revelation 14 verse 13. Important for you to understand this. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. How can you be blessed when you die? Well, you're blessed because the Bible says so. If you die in Christ, you are blessed. You are blessed because you rest from your labors and your works. The things that you have done for Jesus will not be expunged from the record but they will stay to inspire when someone dies who you have in your family or someone who is precious to you you can barely remember anything they did wrong but what they've done right multiplies it gets bigger so their works speak for them after they are gone the fact is that God is not happy when people die he was never happy when people died. And this you must understand. In fact, in, in uh, I don't know, I've got to look this one up. Deuteronomy chapter 
34. Would you go there with me? Uh, if you're not accustomed to finding Deuteronomy, jot it down. Deuteronomy chapter 34. And I'll show you something here that touches my heart. It's not quite an experience the power moment, but it is a touching moment for me. And it says here, starting with verse 5, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher until this day. Let me tell you something amazing about this text. It never quite says who buried Moses. Maybe this is an experience the power moment. The only two beings on the mount were Jesus and Moses. And the Bible says Moses died and he buried him. Well, it's inescapable. The only other one there was Jesus. So watch this. Moses has spoken unadvisedly with his lips. He can't go over into Canaan. But Jesus says, come here, let me show you what's going to happen. Let me open up the future like a video screen. Let me show you what's going to be after you have died. And I will show it to you so you can die with the courage of knowing that my word does not fail. You will see that I will bring the people into the land that I said I would give to them. And after that, he said, because this has happened and you can't speak to me about this thing anymore. He said, now you must sleep. And he buried him. What kind of tenderness is this? If the people of Israel had buried Moses, there would have been a great shrine. There might have been even in some thought a pyramid. Israel didn't do it, but Moses might have been close enough to that culture to have had one built for him. But no one knew where he was buried because the only one who was there was Jesus. If that kind of tenderness exists, and let me tell you what I truly believe. One of my favorite writers says it this way. There are angels who attend God's children all the way until the moment they breathe out their last breath. So you don't die alone if you live with Jesus. You are not alone because the angel goes all the way there. In fact, that same writer says that on resurrection morning, the same angel that accompanied you to death marks the place where you are buried and is there when you are called back to life. So there's a God there, there's a mark there. And when you, well, ah, this gets me excited. Am I the only one in here? You must understand, there are people who say, God is too good to allow my relative to die and be buried. And I, I, I feel the magnetism of that sentiment. God would not allow someone he loved to die and then be buried. But the Bible says, for God so loved his only begotten son, God loved his son with a supreme love. But for our sakes, he allowed his own son to die and to be buried. And I'll tell you what I feel about it. I, I, I can't change what you think. But I, I feel this. If I want to follow Jesus, I can't limit how I follow him. Oh yeah, I want to follow him when he's doing miracles and people are praising him. But I got to remember that if I follow him there, I might end up in a city where they don't like me and they want to chase me out. I want to follow him when he goes across those beautiful meandering plains and when his disciples are following him in peaceful situations. But if I'm going to do that, perhaps I will come to a Gethsemane in my life somewhere. If I want to follow Jesus all the way, then there is no shame in going into a grave, especially if you know that Jesus went 
but Jesus came out if that could happen for God's only son I am not ashamed to be put in a grave particularly when I've got the promise that I'm coming out are you with me so that's what you first must understand now after you know that <laughs> you've got to know that uh, death is not a shame however neither is it a play that is acted for someone's benefit there are some folk who don't believe that death is real now for the next few minutes I've got to talk about how real death is but I had to tell you before I did that that Jesus cares about anybody who dies in him so that you wouldn't think that God has allowed some terrible curse when Jesus was in the tomb the, the human form was dead it was not a, a cinematographer's moment it wasn't fake he didn't fake his death nothing about Jesus is fake so when he was in that tomb I've been to the places that they say were his tomb I've even uh, asked and been permitted to lay down in one of those you know the pretty one have you ever been there I wouldn't want to lay down in the bad one so I chose chose a beautiful one and the guy said you can't go in and I waited until everybody was gone and I can't talk to him so man nobody's here you know? I've been wanting to do this all my life and here I am and I'll be real quiet I'll go in I won't be long and I went and got you know oh, probably wasn't a real place but <laughs> it was such a wonderful thing for me to think that I might be reclining in the place where Jesus body was for a little while in fact the power of that place is that he only needed it for a little while if he had still been there, there would be no power in it. But he only needed for a little while. Let's, let's talk about what happens when you die. The first thing you must understand is that, well, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 16 says, Only God hath immortality. There are words, I, I have the list, I didn't think you needed it. There are words that are used for soul in the Bible. And it's used in Greek and Hebrew and when it's used all of those hundreds of times it is never said to be immortal but there are those who think that they will take the sting out of death by saying that when it looks like you're dead you're not really dead the fact is that when you die you're dead it's simple okay so let, let's talk about it for a minute let's go to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, I've always got to go there because there's some people who believe that there's some mysterious element that got put in the equation. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And if, if I'm in Exodus, that is very wrong. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul I wasn't all that great with math and uh, these equations were not my favorite thing when I was in grade school or in high school but even I can figure this out God forms man out of the dust of the ground breathes into his nostrils the breath of life and man becomes a living soul so it's not difficult to figure out there's a body made out of dust there's the breath of life from Jesus and with those two elements man becomes a living soul there is no other element there if it were Jesus would have had someone write it for us and it would have said body and then breath and then the mysterious thing <laughs> the thing that will never die and then man became a soul that would live forever but remember that the challenge of this whole thought is that the devil says you can sin and not really die and God says if you sin you shall die so let's be really clear as we move that the only thing that makes man 
a soul is breath and body. Do you see it? Well, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 9 is a place where we must go. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. There are people who practically know this by heart. I didn't know it until I came in groups of people who, who know these kinds of things. Incidentally, do you know where the whole thing about uh, something mysterious came from? When you look in texts like Job 27 and verse 3, there are times when the spirit, meaning breath, the spirit, pneuma, the, the same kind of word that describes a pneumatic tire, when you put air in it, it's pneumatic. But that word gets mixed up with spirit, and so many scholars even have come to believe that when body combined with spirit, there was something mysterious there. But the fact is that there's nothing mysterious. The reason why it's important for you to know this is that there are some people who are quite uncomfortable close to a cemetery. It's important to know. You may be the safest you have ever been. Because there are big, bad thugs who are afraid also of cemeteries. So you may be the safest you can get in a cemetery, but the reason why people get a little nervous if you meet them in a funeral home, they're... <laughs> but, but we've got the formula. Well, let's, let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. It'll get really, really clear. And here's what it says. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, starting with verse 5. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more reward, for their memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever and anything that is done under the sun. So if your wife has said to you, when she dies, if you marry again. <laughs> ah, you think this is strange, don't you? You've never heard this before, have you? There are, well, wives generally say it to husbands because the, the uh, facts suggest that women live longer than men. I guess that ought to be instructive. Perhaps some man ought to learn to marry. Uh... <laughs> Don't worry about it, just a passing thought. <laughs> but there are wives who say, you, 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 you let me die. And you bring some strange woman in here wearing my clothes <laughs> sleeping in my bed and there are some men who are afraid of that <laughs> the fact is that the living know that they shall die the dead have no hatred no envy when when that funeral is finished your heart ought to be broken because of the loneliness that naturally ensues and even though you are intellectually convinced that your mate will rise again your emotions respond and that's understandable but nobody's going to come back to do anything if any noises start <laughs> it will not be that person are we together well let me give you another one ecclesiastes, ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 20 let's 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 end it all go into one place all are of the dust and all turn to dust again so the fact is that there is no concern. When, when a person is dead, there is no X factor that seeps out of, the occasion, out of the equation and meanders through the ethereal mist. It's not a B movie. It's reality. God says, here's what happens. I let an angel go all the way to the end with him. I, I, I usher them with those angels who excel in, in strength. I, I let them go all the way to the end with them. And when they die, they are unconscious, they, their thoughts perish. And then that angel is there when I call them back again. So there's no question. Now, somebody's going to ask, so let me answer before you get there. Because I've got a little preaching to do at the end of this sermon. I kind of like it. Uh, the fact is that if that is so, 
if people are actually dead, then what are those things that you see when you go into those small little cubicles that are mysteriously draped with purple and scarlet and there are people there with all kinds of strange attire on and you go in there and say, I want to see my aunt. <laughs> I hope you haven't done it, but some have. Be very quiet and don't move. Nobody will ever know that you're part of that group. And, and there are people who have reported. In fact, there was a television show that might be still in syndication where people actually came on and said, let me talk to somebody who has gone beyond. And the question is, if there's somebody who's answering, who is it? <laughs> Revelation chapter 12. You ought to put a bookmark in this one. Because I know people who will really get concerned about who it is who answers. Some of you looked at the show. Don't change the expression on your face, but be honest enough to admit in your mind that for a minute you worried about it. Who is that? Maybe I ought to talk to somebody. Maybe I ought to get some advice from somewhere. Revelation chapter 12. And uh, look at verse 9. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with it. The devil and his angels, a third of the heavenly host. Let me pause here for a moment to praise the name of God and add a bonus experience the power moment. If the devil, and he did take with him a third of the angelic host, you must remember that one third can never get two thirds. If the devil sends one imp, one angel to give you trouble, God can send two. If he sends 10, God can send 20. If he sends 100, God can send 200. 1,000, God can send 2,000. And when the devil has sent all he has, God still got twice as many. Do you understand? Look with me in 2 Corinthians and let's talk about a couple of things that they do. I can't get too far in it. I don't have time. But you know that there are angels who are the devil's angels who came with him. And here's what 2 Corinthians chapter 11 says. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, start with verse 14. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed formed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works I suggest to you that anything you see looking like your relative can't be your relative because the living know that they shall die the dead know not anything so while I want to comfort you with the assurance that God holds precious the death of those who die in him in fact wishes that no one would ever have to die but you must know that whatever you see moving or whatever sounds you hear, go check your furnace. <laughs> see if you let the cat in. It's not something strange returning to life. But the devil will play on your fears. He does that. Now, here's what I want to suggest. I understand why the devil plays this game. What the devil wants to tell you is simple. If you sin, don't worry. There's no real problem. You will not surely die. All of those religious people, don't let them bother you. Trust me. There's really no death for sinners. I can keep you going and going and going and going so there are all kinds of theories that say one simple thing you can sin and get away with it and what I want to tell you tonight is that the devil is in fact a liar <laughs> you, 
you can't sin with impunity there is a final price to pay for sin and if you pay it you're gonna feel so so bad while you're paying it because you will have known that there was nothing that Jesus could have done that he didn't do I think that's one of the reasons why every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord of Lords in fact you forgive me if I believe that one of those knees that bows will be Satan himself for at the end he will even understand that it was all lost that Christ has done everything that he could have done now I, I want to share this with you because this is my title this is this is my text in in uh, John chapter 11 we came to understand that for Christians death is asleep uh, the difference between sleep and death is really easy to understand I have never been to a funeral no matter how skillful the mortician when I thought the person was sleeping have you you know we have those little things we say at funerals oh she looks so nice she looks so peaceful she looks like she's asleep not so I have never confused anybody at a funeral who was dead I have always known that they were not asleep but if you die in Christ the reason why it can be called asleep the difference between death and sleep essentially is that you wake up from one and keep on living and what Lazarus experience taught us remember the disciples said Lazarus sleeps Jesus had explained to them he's asleep I said well if he sleeps he does well and finally he was clear with them he said he's dead and then they understood but the fact is that in Christ death is not eternal death is not endless so in that sense it's sleep but you've got to know that the fact is that this awakening comes by the power of God Job chapter 10 verses 21 and 22 says that death is a place of darkness and disorder but the fact is that darkness and disorder are the antithesis of Jesus Jesus is is orderly and he is a God of light so darkness and disorder confront him on a very primal level he cannot withstand having his loved ones be put into a situation that even Job in his confused situation will say is darkness and disorder so Jesus takes death personally and he will not allow it to maintain its power the fact is John chapter 5 and verse 28 you've got to find that one John chapter 5 verse 28 Jesus will not allow it to stand unchallenged he will not allow it so John chapter 5 look at verses 28 and 29 you must know it says John the Bible is not working with me tonight but it shall be found <laughs> and so the Bible says they pardon me forgive me I'll find it I've got to because the Bible is what we base this upon can I hear an amen somewhere and here's what it says marvel not at this for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth verse 29 they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation the people who have died in rebellion will be awake for just a moment but those who are resurrected in the name of Christ will rise first they will hear his voice over in Inglewood California there's a, a plot you know they put them all in in those tiny places now you have more than one burial space in just a little space where 16 sometimes are buried there and in that one place is my mother who died before she turned 50 and there's my father who died just in December both of them in that same space and I get excited because I believe what the Bible says they can't hear my voice I don't go out there and talk I, I have nothing to say when I go there I, I have gone from time to time to make sure it's in order 
But the only voice that they will hear is the voice of Jesus when he says, come forth. I believe that. I believe that Isaiah chapter 25 verses 8 and 9 says that death will be swallowed up. I believe that Jesus who has taken it personally will not allow it to stand. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 23 is where we started and that's where I want to go. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 23 and let's unpack what the Bible says. For as in Adam all die, verse 22. Even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but every man in his own order. When I went to dig underneath this phrase, here is what it means. It's a term that was only used about the military. It's a military term that says, you march in the group, you march in the brigade, you march in the very force that you have been assigned to, and it's a sequential organization. So those who have died first, the text seems to suggest, will come up first. Jesus, the first fruits. Without the resurrection of Christ, there would be no hope for resurrection. But let me tell you what I believe. I believe that since Jesus takes this thing so personally, I believe that first of all, he will make certain that it is a dramatic way that we come forth. There are people who think that some people are popping up here, some are popping up there. I don't believe Jesus wants it to be that way. That is not according to his character. He is orderly in character, but he dislikes death. He despises death. So the text in Isaiah says that death will die. Death, the killer. Death that has robbed us. Death that took loved ones. Finally, God will say, you, death, must die. He'll not do it. He'll not do it out of order. He'll not do it out of order. In fact, verse 26, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 26. It says, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So would you mind if I just go ahead and preach a minute? I believe that God will not allow death to escape out of some spider hole. Death will not be able to run away and hide in the darkness. But Jesus will wait until all principalities and powers, until everything that lifts itself against his kingdom is put down. And then the last enemy, death, and, and the apostle Paul personifies death. And he says, it then will be the last enemy to be destroyed. And if that is so, then the Bible says, those who have died in Christ will come forth like soldiers. In ranks. Forgive me if I do a little black preaching here. There is imagination in black preaching. And I believe that in those ranks, there are going to be some of those people who were closer to the beginning of time when they were taller than we are. So I wouldn't be surprised if a tall brigade came marching. <laughs> Coming up from death and marching. A little later when sin began to do its work, they went a little shorter. So I see the taller people and then the shorter people and the shorter people. But then I remember that text that says in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall all be changed. So maybe you come up shorter but you stretch in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. I believe that we will come marching. In fact, when Job picked up a similar kind of word, when you read in Job 14, 14, Job says, all the days of my appointed time, will I wait till my change comes? I checked it out. It's a military term. He said, I've been put in the army. I've been fighting faithfully. And if I've got to go to sleep, let me sleep until your wrath be passed. That shows his misunderstanding of, of what prophecies might have meant. But then he said, Lord, appoint me a time and remember me. All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. What 
Job is saying is, I believe I'm coming forth. I don't know where I'm going to be in which brigade. I don't know how tall or short I will be in comparison. But let me tell you what I believe. I do not believe that there will be some strange little quiet resurrection. I believe the trumpet will sound, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I believe that the voice of the archangel will be heard. I believe that Jesus with all of his holy angels will be seen in the midst of the sky. And he said, I myself, I will come personally and I will call them. And that we will meet together in the clouds. And I believe, my friends, that it will be the greatest spectacle of God's power that the earth has ever seen. It'll be the greatest family reunion that anybody has ever experienced. But it won't be something quiet in the corner. It will have all the drama that you can expect. It will be more than you could have ever expected. And when that day comes, I hope by the grace of God to be washed in the blood of Jesus. So wherever Jesus says, you ought to be here, I want to march in my place when death has no more victory. Now, until Friday night, may God hear you when you call. May God lift you if you fall. May God bless you as you stand. May God hold you in the palm of his hand. Good night. Walter Pearson believes that Jesus Christ is the answer to every problem you face.